chapter six, section one. What's wrong with this free market justice? It does not take much imagination to figure out whose interest, uh, whose interest prosperous arbitrators, judges, and defense companies would defend their own, as well as those who pay their wages, which is to say other members of the rich elite. As the law exists to defend property, then it, by definition, exists to defend the power of capitalists against their workers. Rothbard argues that the judges would, quote, not be making the law but finding it on the basis of agreed-upon principles derived from either from custom or reason. However, this begs the question, whose reason, whose customs? Do individuals in different classes share the same customs? The same ideas of right and wrong? Would rich and poor desire the same from a basic law code? (laughs) Of course, obviously not. The rich would only support a code which defended their power over the poor. Although only finding the law, the arbitrators and judges still exert an influence in the justice (laughs) process. An influence not impartial or neutral. As the arbitrators themselves would be a part of the uh, part of a profession, which specific companies developing within the market, it does not take a genius to realize that when interpreting the basic law code, such companies would hardly act against their own interests as companies. In addition, if the justice system was based on one dollar one vote, the law would be best uh, would best defend those with the most votes. The question of market forces will be discussed in section three of this chapter. Moreover. Even if market forces would ensure that impartial judges were dominant, all judges would be enforcing a very partial law code, namely one that defended capitalist property rights. Impartially, when enforcing partial laws, hardly makes judgments less unfair. Thus, due to these three pressures, the interests uh, the interest of arbitrators and judges, the influence of money and the nature of the law, the terms of free agreements under such a law system would then be tilted in favor of lenders over debtors, landlords over tenants, employers over employees, and in general, the rich over the poor, just as we have today. This is what one would expect in a system based on unrestricted property rights and a capitalist free market. A similar similar tendency towards the standardization of output in an industry in response to influences of wealth can be seen from the current media system. Some so-called anarcho-capitalists, however, claim that just as cheaper cars were developed to meet demand, so cheaper defense associations and people's arbitrators would develop on the market for the working class. In this way, impartiality will be ensured. This, of course, overlooks a few key points. Firstly, the general libertarian law code would be applicable to all associations, so they would have to operate within a system determined by the power of money and of capital. The law code would reflect, therefore, property, not labor, and so socialistic law codes would be outlawed, uh, would be classed as outlaw ones. The options when facing working uh, the options then facing uh, facing working people is to select a firm which best enforce the capitalist law in their favor. And as noted above, the impartial enforcement of a biased law code will hardly ensure freedom or justice. Secondly, in a race between a Jaguar and a Volkswagen Beetle, who is more likely to win? The rich would have the best justice money can buy, as they do now. Members of the capitalist class would be able to select the firms with the best lawyers, best private cops, and most resources. Those without the financial clout to purchase quality justice would simply be uh, be out of luck, such as the magic of the marketplace. Thirdly, because of the tendency towards concentration, centralization, and oligopoly, Oh my God, uh, oligop- oligopoly, Jesus Christ, sorry, uh, under capitalism, <laughs> oh, oligarchy and og- oligopoly uh, just doesn't roll off the tongue. Under capitalism, due to increasing capitalist costs for new firms entering the market, a few companies would soon dominate the market um, with obvious implications for justice. Different firms will have different resources. In other words, in a conflict between a small firm and a larger one, the smaller one is at a disadvantage in terms of resources. 
They may not be in a position to fight the larger company if it rejects our uh, arbitration and so may give in simply because, as the so-called anarcho-capitalists so rightly point out, conflict and violence will push up a company's costs and so they would have to be avoided by smaller companies. It's ironic that the so-called anarcho-capitalist implicitly assumes that every defense company is approximately the same size with the same resources behind it. In real life, this would not be the case. Uh, fourth, it is very likely that many companies would make subscription to a specific defense firm or court a requirement of employment. Just as today, as many... Most workers have to sign no union or non-compete contracts and face being fired if they change their minds. It doesn't take much imagination to see that the same could apply to defense firms and courts. This was, is the case in company towns. Indeed, you can consider unions as a form of defense firm and these companies refuse to recognize them. As the labor market is almost always a buyer's market, it is not enough to argue that workers can find a new job without this condition. They may not, and so have to put up with this situation. And if, as seems likely, the laws and rules of the property owner will take precedence in any conflict, then workers and tenants will be at a disadvantage no matter how impartial the judge is. Ironically, some so-called anarcho-capitalists point to current-day company union negotiations as an example of how different defense firms would work out their differences peacefully. <sighs> Sadly for this argument, union rights under actually existing capitalism were created and enforced by the state in direct opposition to capitalist freedom of contract. Before the law was changed, unions were often crushed by force. Looking at you, Pinkertons. The companies were better armed, had more resources, and had the law on their side. Today, with the downsizing of companies, we can see what happens to peaceful negotiations and cooperation between unions and companies when it's no longer required, i.e. when the resources of both sides are unequal. The market power of companies far exceeds those of the unions and the law. By definition, favors the companies. As an example of how competing protection agencies will work in a so-called anarcho-capitalist society, it is far more insightful than originally intended. Now, let us consider the basic law code itself. How the laws in the general libertarian law code would actually be selected is anyone's guess, actually. Although many so-called anarcho-capitalists support the myth of natural law, and this would suggest an unchangeable law code selected by those considered as the voice of nature... <sighs> See chapter 11 for a discussion of its authoritarian implications, if you want to know more. David Friedman argues that, as well as a market in defense companies, there'd be a market in laws and rights. However, there will be extensive market pressure to unify, uh, to unify these differing law codes into one standard one. Imagine what would happen if every CD manufacturer tried to create a unique CD player or every computer manufacturer created different, uh, different style hard drives. Little wonder then that over time companies standardize their products. Friedman himself acknowledges that this process is likely and uses an example of standardized paper sizes to indicate such a process. In any event, the laws would not be decided on the basis of one person, one vote. Hence, as market forces work their magic, the general law code would reflect vested interests and so be very hard to change. As rights and laws would be a commodity like anything else in capitalism, they would soon reflect the interests of the rich, particularly if those interpreting the law are wealthy professionals and when companies with vested interests of their own. Little wonder that the individualist anarchist proposed a trial by jury is the only basis for real justice in a free society. For unlike professional ar arbitrators, juries are ad hoc, made up of ordinary people and do not reflect power, authority, or influence of wealth, when done correctly. And by being able to judge the law as well as a conflict, they can ensure a populist revision of laws as society progresses. Thus, a system of defense on the market will continue to reflect the influence and power of property owners and 